in the class. Everybody, worn out from the three-day weekend? I had hoped to have, give, have exams to get back to. I don't have them yet. I think my oh. TAs were three-day weekending themselves a little too much myself. But uh, I will let you know as soon as they're ready. It should be ready soon. I guess we can go, go ahead and get started. You guys are quiet early. I don't know what's going on here. Too much fun over the three-day weekend? No. Too little biochemistry over the three-day weekend? No. All right. Um, so today I'm going to finish up talking about the citric acid cycle and start putting some of this into context. And this context will become, I hope and think, quite clear when I start talking about the electron transport system and oxidative phosphorylation because it's at that place that all of this uh, metabolic stuff comes to a head. And um, we shall see. Last time when I talked about the cycle, I went through and showed you the reactions and gave you all the enzymes and all that sort of stuff. And somebody came to me after the, the last exam and said, oh, Kevin, you know, I memorized all that glycolysis, but you didn't ask us glycolysis. And I said, well, yes, I did. I asked you several questions about glycolysis, but you didn't ask us the whole pathway. Well, I can tell you, I'm never going to ask you a pathway. All right? That doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't know the pathway, but I'm not going to ask you to go regurgitate a pathway. That's about as as simple-minded as it can be. So I want you to know things about it and out of it, but I will never ask you a pathway. You can rest assured of that, OK? Uh, so the same is true of this one. And we'll see several more pathways uh, in the next, believe it or not, we have, what, one, two, three, counting today, and four more lectures next week, and we're done, seven lectures. Is that a question? Or are you just holding your pen up there like that? Yeah. You're airing your pen? Yeah. OK, good, all right. So um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about control. Because control of this pathway really is central to uh, our own metabolism. And as I say, I think you'll see this as we talk about electron transport. There's all kinds of things that we can memorize about control. Okay, well, you can see some of them on here. You can see that pyruvate dehydrogenase is inhibited by ATP, acetyl-CoA, and NADH. And you can see that the uh, succinyl, uh, I'm sorry, the, the um, citrate synthase is inhibited by this, this, and this. And this is inhibited by this, this, and this. And this is inhibited by this, this, and this. And those are points of control, but they really obscure the picture. There's one central theme that relates to all of these. Okay, One central thing. And it's a theme that you've heard before. Okay, If you recall, when we did glycolysis, we did fermentation under certain conditions. Why did we do fermentation? We had no oxygen, and we had no oxygen. Why did, we, why did we do fermentation? What was the reason? We want to regenerate NAD because we have limiting amounts of NAD. All right? The same is true in the citric acid cycle, and it occurs in the mitochondrion, limiting amounts of NAD. Well, the citric acid cycle is even more dependent upon NAD than glycolysis was. There are three reactions in the citric acid cycle that require NAD. There's a reaction leading into the citric acid cycle that requires NAD. And there's a reaction in the citric acid cycle that requires FAD. Same problem. So if we don't have a way of converting NADH back to NAD or FADH2 back to FAD, we will stop the cycle. So I'm not going to ask you to memorize all these various things that are on here because I think it's counterproductive. And to be, re to be honest with you, most of them aren't that important. The most important regulator of the cycle is NAD and FAD. Okay? These are the most important regulators of the cycle. So any reaction that requires NAD is going to be in trouble if it doesn't have it. Any reaction that requires FAD is going to be in trouble if it doesn't have it. And that's what those little purple stars there are referring to. Okay? going to be in deep trouble if we don't have those things there. All right? Now, one of the disadvantages of the citric acid cycle is it can't rely on fermentation. Fermentation occurs out in the cytoplasm. It doesn't occur in the mitochondrion. So when there's no oxygen in the mitochondrion, 
the mitochondria is going to sit there and twiddle its thumbs. And that's why it's so important that we keep glycolysis going with NAD because if a cell is rapidly metabolizing like an exercising muscle cell that's not getting enough oxygen, its only way of generating energy is by keeping glycolysis going. And that requires NAD from fermentation that's available in the cytoplasm. Okay? So that's very, very important. Now, we'll see in a little bit why this uh, comes up. But if you just basically know that when NAD is lacking and FAD is lacking, you're stopping the citric acid cycle, you got a big jump on understanding the big picture. Okay? Big, big jump. Okay. That's all the energy of the cycle. I, there's nothing on, on here. In fact, I'm just showing you this overall. The overall thing of the cycle is that the overall cycle has a negative delta G0 prime of minus 77. That's a very negative number. Okay. Um, you'll notice that I said that the last oxidation was one that was not energetically very favorable. as a value of plus 30, basically, 29.2. And it's pulled by the reaction after it with a value of minus 33.4. Okay. So that's what makes possible this overall uh, process is the fact that the um, citrate synthase, I'm sorry, the citrate synthase reaction is right here, it's 32.2. The citrate synthase reaction pulls the overall process and makes sure that the cell um, has enough energy to keep the citric acid cycle going. Okay. Now, this figure is a little daunting, and I don't show it to you to give you a bunch of things to memorize, because again, that's not the uh, purpose here. We'll talk about some of these things uh, next week, actually, when we, when we talk a little bit about amino acid metabolism. But I just show you this figure to give you an idea about how interconnected the citric acid cycle is to all the other metabolic pathways in your cells. Okay? So here's the citric acid cycle going inside of here. These arrows that you can see here are things that are made out in the cytoplasm that get dumped in the mitochondria so they can be metabolized further. Okay? Well, what it's telling us is that here's asparagine going to aspartate gets in here. It tells us that tyrosine and phenylalanine can go to fumarate and get in there. It tells us that these guys can go to glutamate and get in there. All right? What it's telling us is that virtually every, and it's not every amino acid, but many of the amino acids can be broken down via intermediates in the citric acid cycle. They get converted into an intermediate that's useful in the citric acid cycle. That's a very, very important component. So the citric acid cycle is intimate with metabolic pathways in the rest of the cell. Okay? Amino acids are very, very important contributors to this. And again, because these amino acids can feed into here, if I'm eating a high-protein diet, I don't have to have carbs. I don't have to have carbs because I can get energy from the citric acid cycle here. And if I get plenty of these things, I can actually make enough oxaloacetate to go ahead and make glucose. Okay. When we look at anabolic processes, that is making things instead of breaking things down, what we see is uh, a couple of interesting things. I've pointed out a couple of them to you already. One is that uh, alpha ketoglutarate can go and, and be made into glutamic acid, which is an amino acid. I've also pointed out that oxaloacetate um, can go to make aspartic acid. That's actually not shown on here. Okay? Now, I'm going to say a little bit about this uh, in a little bit, so don't get too confused about what's uh, going on up here. But suffice it to say that we cannot take acetyl-CoA in net amounts and make glucose from it. We can't do that. Okay? not in net amounts. All right? We'll see why that's the case in just a little bit. But we can't do that. Plants and uh, yeast and bacteria, on the other hand, can do that because they have another cycle in their cells that allows them uh, to do that. Okay. Here's a relationship of this cycle to gluconeogenesis. We remember, of course, that um, Exaloacetate is an intermediate in making PEP and gluconeogenesis. PEP can be made by other means up here also uh, to go into gluconeogenesis. So uh, the citric acid cycle ties in not only into amino acid uh, synthesis and breakdown, but also into glucose uh, synthesis. And 
In addition, the citric acid cycle ties into both fatty acid synthesis and fatty acid oxidation. What you see here is a pathway that's involved in fatty acid synthesis that we'll talk about. And with respect to fatty acid oxidation, when fatty acids are broken down, they're broken down in the mitochondrion, and they're broken down into acetyl-CoA. So conveniently, acetyl-CoA can be oxidized right there at the very place where the fatty acids are being broken down. So the citric acid cycle is tied into virtually every important process that's occurring inside of our cells. All right, well, having said that about the citric acid cycle, I want to take a minute and talk about a related cycle. And the related cycle is, a, is the cycle that I mentioned uh, a minute ago that is found in plants and yeast and bacteria. It's called the glyoxylate cycle. And it's actually quite simple, but it'll take me a, a few minutes to step you through it just to make sure that you understand the significance of it. The glyoxylate cycle is partly overlaid on top of the citric acid cycle, meaning that the glyoxylate cycle uses several enzymes of the citric acid cycle. Several enzymes of the citric acid cycle. The glyoxylate cycle differs, however, in that organisms that have the glyoxylate cycle have two different enzymes that we don't possess. And because they have these two enzymes, we'll see that they can actually short circuit some things in the citric acid cycle. Well, how does it start? The citric acid cycle starts very much like the um, pathway for making, um, uh, for, for the, I'm sorry, the glyoxylate cycle starts very much the way that the citric acid cycle starts. Acetyl-CoA combines with oxaloacetate and makes citrate. Same reaction as the citric acid cycle. Citrate synthase, same enzyme, okay? Citrate gets converted to isocitrate, just like the citric acid cycle, same enzyme again. And then, once we've got isocitrate, plants, yeast, and bacteria have an enzyme called isocitrate lyase. Okay? Isocitrate lyase. And what it does is it breaks this six carbon isocitrate into a four carbon piece of succinate and a two-carbon piece of glyoxylate. That's what gives it its name. Okay? Now, this is a divergence from the citric acid cycle. In the citric acid cycle, we would normally be oxidizing isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate and losing the carbon dioxide. So what the, what the glyoxylate cycle is doing is it's bypassing two decarboxylations in the citric acid cycle. It's bypassing two decarboxylations in the citric acid cycle. Well, what happens to succinate? Well, the same thing that happens inside of the citric acid cycle, succinate goes to fumarate, and fumarate goes to malate, and malate goes to oxaloacetate. So this part goes just like the citric acid cycle. All we've done is we've bypassed two decarboxylations. Okay. Well, there's more to the story, though, because we've got this glyoxylate sitting over here, and the glyoxylate is used for something else. The glyoxylate can be combined with, a, with another acetyl-CoA using another enzyme that's unique to these cells, malate synthase, and that gives malate. So what's just happened? Well. We started with a single acetyl-CoA, and we ended up with an oxaloacetate. We added a second acetyl-CoA to the glyoxylate, and we got a second oxaloacetate. So we started with one oxaloacetate, and we ended up with two. Well, if I do this once, I end up with two. If I take two through it, I'll end up with four, et cetera, et cetera. Every time I go through this cycle, I'm going to make more and more extra oxaloacetate. That's really different than the citric acid cycle. Because in the citric acid cycle, I start with one oxaloacetate, and I end up with one oxaloacetate. Right? Well, that's important. Because it means that if in my cells, let's say I, wanna, I need to make glucose, I can take that oxaloacetate, I can steal it 
and put it through gluconeogenesis, I can do that, but I'm going to slow down or stop the citric acid cycle because oxaloacetate is needed for the citric acid cycle, right? So that's why I say I can't make glucose in net amounts in my cells using acetyl-CoA. Because I put two carbons in and two carbon dioxides get produced, I don't have any net gain of carbons. However, these cells, plants, yeast, and bacteria, put two carbons in, they put two more carbons in, they end up with an extra four carbon piece of oxaloacetate. That means that these guys can then take that extra oxaloacetate and just kick it out to gluconeogenesis. So they can start with acetyl-CoA and make glucose in net amounts. We can't do that. If we could do that, that would be pretty cool for weight loss because the product of my breaking down fatty acids is acetyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA, if acetyl-CoA could be converted into glucose, I would have a very rapid way to burn off fat. I can't do that. Yeast and bacteria and plants have it, have it easy. That's why you never see a fat plant or a fat yeast or a fat bacterium for that matter, right? Does that make sense? Now, one question arises is, well, do these guys have the glyoxylate cycle instead of the citric acid cycle? And the answer is no. They both occur. They both occur in the cell. And you're sitting there going, oh, God, now I've got to know which one, which one works when. Well, A, I'm not going to ask you which one works when, which probably means that 90% of you are just going to go, Whoosh. I'm not going to pay any more attention to that. Okay? But I will tell you that the answer is rooted in the same thing that the answer to the penose phosphate is rooted in. It depends on the cell's needs. The cell needs certain things that, that are favored by this process. It will, it will use them. And if it needs things that are favored by the citric acid cycle process, it will favor that. Yes, sir? So is fumarate part of this cycle as well? Fumarate is a part of this cycle as well. Okay. Yep. Okay. So what's, so what's the difference in the products of the two? The products of the two are the citric acid cycle gives us three NADHs and one FADH2. Okay? If the cell is wanting those electrons for energy purposes, the citric acid cycle will be a good way to go. If the cell is, has, if, I'm sorry, if the cell is wanting to make glucose because it has plenty of those things already, then it's got a way to go do it. And making glucose will use NADH. It will use NADH. So that works really nicely. So depending upon the cell's needs, one or the other, or even both, may be uh, going on at the same time. There's the isocitrate lyase reaction, for what it's worth. And there's the um, malate synthase reaction, uh, for what it's worth. Okay. Questions about that before I dive into electron transport? Okay. Electron transport. Well, electron transport is uh, typically taught after the citric acid cycle because we've been talking a lot about making NADH and now FADH2 from the citric acid cycle as well. So it's appropriate that we start dealing with, well, how does the cell deal with converting NADH back to NAD. This happens through the process of electron transport. And I'm getting ready to talk about two processes, okay? Two processes, and though they are interdependent on each other, they are separate processes. They both occur in the mitochondrion. They both occur in the mitochondrion. And we will see that similar processes occur in the chloroplast in photosynthesis. Well, let's go back to our mitochondrion. There we are. There's the mitochondrion. It's got um, these various features that I described to you earlier. And the most important point I told you earlier was that that inner mitochondrial membrane is very impermeable 
to most substances. This includes protons. Fortunately, it does not include water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Those four pass fairly freely through the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay. This process or this uh, figure shows us a little bit about what's happening in electron transport. Now, electron transport is, um, I think, an almost hard to believe process occurring inside of our cells. It's literally electronic circuitry. It's as close to an electronic circuit as anything that you'll find in biology. Okay? And you find it throughout biology. It's a remarkable process. In this process, energy from electrons is being used to make ATP. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds an awful lot like electricity to me. Energy from electrons is being used to make ATP. And those electrons are passing literally through a circuit. It's a cellular circuit. And this figure is showing you something of that cellular circuit. I'm going to simplify it for you in a little bit. But the electrons start, in this case, at NADH. Ener electrons are at their highest energy uh, state. And they literally go down the hill, just like water would flow down a hill, until they get to the final acceptor of electrons, molecular oxygen. In order for electron transport to function, the one thing you want to write down is this. In order for electron transport to function, oxygen must be present. Oxygen accepts the electrons at the end and makes water. That's what happens. If oxygen is not present, there's no place for the electrons to go. The electrons that can't make it here will back up to here. The electrons backed up here will back up to here, will back up to here, will back up to here, will back up to here. And ultimately, that means that we'll be stuck with NADH because NADH has no place to put its electrons. It's for this reason when cells run out of oxygen, they can't make NAD. There's no place for NADH to dump its electrons to. No place for it to dump its electrons to. Very, very important consideration. OK. This is another way of looking at the same process. And I'm not totally fond of this one either. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to give you some new names for this one. Okay. When we look at what happens with electron transport, okay. by the way, electron transport, this circuitry that um, I'm talking about inside of cells is actually, uh, with, with one exception, proteins that are passing these electrons back and forth. Question back there? So when you say electron, is that synonymous with a hydrogen atom? Okay, good question. Is electron synonymous with a hydrogen atom? The answer is no. We're talking about individual electrons. In general, electrons enter the system in pairs, and they exit it singly. I'll, I'll show you how that happens. But Whenever we see an oxidation, we almost always see loss of a proton, but the proton has nothing to do with the oxidation. OK? All right. Here's NADH. NADH dumps its electrons off to the first protein that accepts the electrons. And this protein has a name that's about this long. And we're going to call it, as most people call it, complex 1. Very simple. So NADH dumps its electrons off to complex 1. And complex 1 is very accommodating. It accepts the electrons and accepts them in pairs. As I said, electrons enter the system in pairs. Complex 1 passes off its electrons to this molecule called coenzyme Q or CoQ, also what it's called. Okay. CoQ has a unique ability. It can accept electrons in pairs, but it passes them out one at a time. And that's important because the carriers down the line can't accept them in pairs. They've got to have them one at a time. So coenzyme Q functions as like what I call a traffic cop. Here's two electrons. One go through, then let the other one go through. 
and everybody's happy. Coenzyme Q takes its electrons and passes them off to the next protein in the system, which has a name and it's called complex 3. I haven't said complex 2 yet. Relax. Complex 1, coenzyme Q, complex 3. Okay. Complex 3 passes off its electrons to another or electron, I should say. Passes off its electron to another pro protein, a very small protein called cytochrome C. You notice that the complexes, there's three, com three, three complexes here, and there's one complex over here. Complex 1, complex 3, and complex 4, which is down here. They're called complexes because they're big, honking units composed of many proteins. They're complicated, and they can't move very freely in the membrane. So they need small molecules or small proteins to act as shuttles of the, <laughs> excuse me, of the electrons. Coenzyme Q is a small molecule. It moves very freely in the membrane. It functions that shuttle purpose very readily. Cytochrome C turns out to be a small protein, and it too moves things very readily. It's only a small protein is all it is. All right. Cytochrome C is taking a, an electron from complex 3, and it passes it off to complex 4. And complex 4 takes the electron, and one at a time, in four steps, it passes electrons off to molecular oxygen and adds some protons to it and creates two molecules of water. Okay? Yes. So here's complex four. It accepts electrons from cytochrome C, one at a time. It takes one electron, it passes it on. It takes another electron, passes it on. It takes another, passes it on. It takes another, passes it on. It does that four times. And when it's done, it's created two molecules of water because four protons get added at the same time. Okay. Now, as I said, if I don't have oxygen, then this guy can't pass electrons. Then this guy can't pass electrons. This guy can't. It backs all the way up. One thing I haven't told you out of this system is how FADH2 donates its electrons. Okay? If you remember back when I talked about the citric acid cycle, I said that there was one enzyme that was not found in the matrix of the mitochondria. Anybody remember who, what it was? Nobody, nobody, nobody looked at biochemistry over the three-day weekend? I like your shirt, by the way. <laughs> okay, it's succinate dehydrogenase, which happens to be the enzyme that uses FAD and makes FADH2. Okay, that enzyme is also known as complex two. Complex two donates its electrons to coenzyme Q. And coenzyme Q goes and does the rest of its thing. So we see electrons can come in from two different places, either through complex 1 with NADH or through complex 2 for FADH2. Both of them converge at coenzyme Q. Okay? Now, there's one other thing about this system. Okay, what I've just shown you is the circuitry. I've shown you that these electrons can come in. I've shown you that you can make water. But you probably are saying, hey, Kevin, water is not the same as ATP. And I will agree with you. Water is not the same as ATP. Somehow the energy of these electrons have to be captured. And that's the very cool part of the process. The energy is captured in a mechanism that I call charging the battery. Charging the battery. What happens? Well, let's start here at complex one. When electrons pass through complex one, complex one grabs 
some protons from the mitochondrial matrix and kicks them out into the inner membrane space. That is, it kicks them out of the matrix. Complex 3 does the same thing. Complex 4 does the same thing. All three of those guys grab protons from the matrix and kick them out of the matrix. So what does that mean? It means that the concentration of protons is higher outside of the matrix than it is inside of the matrix. Yes? Where do they get the energy to transfer their protons? By the movement of electrons through them. Now that's the, the really remarkable thing. We're talking about an engine. An electrical engine is functioning in your mitochondria. Electrons drive every engine on the face of the earth and they drive the engines that are inside of our cells. This engine is taking the energy from electrons and it's moving protons instead of being an, uh, an engine that takes energy from gasoline and moves a piston. But it's the same principle. Okay? Same principle. Exactly the same thing's going on. So, we've created a gradient of protons. Higher concentration of protons outside than inside. From what we've talked about so far, you should remember that there's going to be a pressure. Those protons want back in. There's going to be a charge difference. There's going to be a concentration difference. And the two of those combined can be used for energy. We'll see that later. We're not going to make ATP yet. As I said, we're charging the battery. We're not discharging the battery. We're storing this energy later so we can use it to make ATP. Is that a question you had? The protons are in between the two membranes. They're in what we call the intermembrane space. Can they leave the intermembrane space? Yeah. But things happen fast enough, they probably don't have a chance to go very far, as we will see. Yes, sir? So complex 2 is succinate dehydrogenase. Complex 2 and succinate dehydrogenase, the terms are used interchangeably. Uh -huh. and that is on the other side of FADH2? That's what, what has the FADH2. Okay. Very cool. All right. So that's what's happening in electron transport. Now, we see that electrons are driving the process. They get down here to their lowest energy state, and the process of moving through that energy state, their energy has been captured in the form of a proton gradient. The energy is captured in the form of a proton gradient. That's charging the battery. And you're literally charging it because you're putting extra positive charges outside of the mitochondrial matrix. This shows the process in a little more detail. There's the matrix. There's the intermembrane space. Electrons are flowing from left to right. And what we see is they enter from NADH. They pass through this complex one, which, as I said, is a, is a fairly complex mixture of proteins. That results in the pumping of protons out. That's not shown on here. P protons will get moved from here upwards. Coenzyme Q accepts those electrons, passes them off to complex 3, which pumps protons also. Complex 3 donates its electrons to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C dumps its electrons into complex 4, which donates them to oxygen to make water. Don't confuse electrons and protons. Very common mistake. Okay? Electrons are being passed from complex to complex. Protons are being pumped. And it's the protons that will be ultimately used to make the ATP. You want to get really confused? Look at that. But we're not going to do that. 
And there's nothing on here that's of any significance. It's just a figure that's showing you how it is that coenzyme Q can accept two electrons and give off one at a time. If you're a chemist, you'll like that. If you're not a chemist, you probably won't pay too much attention to it. OK. That, in a nutshell, is electron transport. Yes, question back to that. Where do the protons come from? OK. Well, molecular, uh, the, any solution of water, because it has a pH of 7, typically has about 10 to the minus 7th molar protons, moles per liter. So there's plenty of protons in the mitochondrial matrix that always just got to reach out and grab one. Good question. Yep. Where, why is, it, is the oxygen, the oxygen just accumulating there, or has it got a, a signal that's coming to there to get the electrons? OK. So ox, his question is, how does oxygen get the electrons, I think? Is that why is it there? Why is the oxygen there? Is why is oxygen there? So complex four has actually sequestered it. And it's a, it's a complicated process. It's actually interesting. Since you asked the question, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit here that's kind of cool from a human health perspective. Okay? So I said that there were four electrons that had to get donated to molecular oxygen to make water. Right? And I said they occurred one at a time. Bang, 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 bang. Right? Bang, 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 bang. That's four. I did five. Okay. I had to count my bangs. All right. Now, that process doesn't always fully go to completion. If it doesn't go to completion, you get an oxygen that might have two electrons, which makes a peroxide. Or maybe it's got uh, one electron, which makes a superoxide. Or maybe it's got three, and there's all kinds of things that can happen. What happens is, if this process doesn't complete cleanly, you create what are called reactive oxygen species. And reactive oxygen species, we've talked about briefly, they are nasty because they will react immediately. Okay? They react with the first thing that they hit, bang. Nasty stuff. It's probably for this reason that when we look at the mitochondria of old cells in the microscope and we compare it to the appearance of mitochondria from new cells in the microscope, there's a world of difference. The old cells look all beat up. Why? Because they've had many years to accumulate damage from reactive oxygen species. And the new cells with brand new shiny mitochondria look beautiful. Okay? So reactive oxygen uh, species are important, and over time, they probably uh, do affect things like our longevity. People have argued for years that reactive oxygen species result in aging because what they, what it, they do is they cause damage to cellular components. And especially with the mitochondria, we can see that process happening. Okay. Questions about that? All right. Well, let's turn our attention to the very next step in the process because now we're going to understand something about, or should we do a song and then do that? Song first or process first? So people always want song first. Okay. Let's do song. They wake you up. This is an old song uh, that probably many of you don't know, but it's the tune of Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. Oh, okay. This one, this one has brain farts just happen in my head. So, Brain farts just happen in my head. I think it might be due to something Kevin said. Biochemistry gets brain farts are popping in my head and they're popping. So I just wiped out the teardrops from my eyes and told my brain it had to do some mental exercise. Burn some ATP so brain farts can stop inside my head. They'll be stopping. Because there's one thing I've learned. When energy increases, it sure pleases. My mental state, I'm doing great as tension eases. Da -da -da. Now brain farts don't happen in my head. So I'm sure the final will be easier instead. Cyclic AMP stops 
brain farts from popping in my head. They're not popping. Thanks to caffeine, nothing's worrying me. All right. Okay. Why don't we stand up and stretch? You're just kind of a lethargic today. Yes. Breathe deeply. Okay. Okay. What you see on the screen is one of the most remarkable proteins in all of nature. It's an enzyme called ATP synthase, and it is the only protein that's involved in the process of oxidative phosphorylation. It's the only protein that's involved in that process. It's found in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay? It's found in the inner mitochondrial membrane. What this guy does is it takes protons from outside of the matrix, which is up here in the scheme on the top. Okay? It takes protons, and protons enter these little chambers. These guys are little chambers here, the purple and blue things. It enters through these chambers, and it causes, and this is remarkable, this thing here to spin. It actually physically spins. Now, when we start thinking of engines and we start thinking of generating energy, one of the thoughts that always comes to my mind is the turbine that we put in front of a river. We turn the turbine so we make electricity, right? In this case, the electricity is the protons that's turning the turbine. So turning the turbine is essential for what I'm getting ready to tell you. If we have a higher concentration of protons outside than inside, protons want in. That's the driving force to get them in to this, this chamber. This thing's called ATP synthase. It's also called complex 5. Don't confuse it with the other complexes. This has nothing to do with electron transport. This only has to do with oxidative phosphorylation. This thing spins. Well, this thing is attached to this little handle down here. And this little handle rotates inside of this head of this mushroom. It's an upside down mushroom. Okay? So I'm trying to get you to picture what this actually is looking like. All right? Well, the rotation turns out to be the driving force. It's now upside down, unfortunately. But the driving force for making the ATP. The ATPs are made in these units here. This guy is spinning, okay? That spins this guy, which spins this green thing, and the spinning of this green thing causes these proteins in the head of the mushroom to change shape, and the changing of the shape ends up squeezing together ADP and phosphate to make ATP. It's a physical manipulation that's putting them together. So this is a backwards turbine. A turbine that we use in a river generates electricity. This is using electricity, and it's using it to make ATP. Okay? I'm going to show you this in another way. Here are those units that you just saw. This is the head of the mushroom looking down on, on the top of it now. We're looking right at the head of the mushroom. These units are identical, except they vary slightly in shape depending upon which one, which way that little green thing is pointing at. The pointing of the green thing 
causes shape changes in these proteins. There are three sites. They're called L, T, and O. They stand for loose, tight, and open. Okay? Now, here's a site up on top. It's in the loose configuration. Okay? Loose configuration doesn't hold anything, but it can bind, I shouldn't say it doesn't hold anything, it doesn't do anything, but it can bind ADP and phosphate. That's the function of it. When energy is applied, that is the rotation of this inner thing rotates, L converts into T. So this guy that was L becomes T. Well, when it goes to T, T stands for tight. And in the tight configuration, ADP and phosphate, which were just sitting here before, get physically scrunched into each other to make ATP. A physical joining of these two to make ATP. Well, when this guy changes to T, all right, what was the O changes to L. This is where the next ATP will be made over here. And what was T, it's still labeled T, but it actually is in the process of changing to O, meaning open, and it's going to release the ATP, which is already just done here. Okay? So the functions. O is to release the ATP. L is to bind the ADP and the phosphate. And T is to make the ATP. And as this thing rotates, it just keeps continually changing, 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 changing shapes, as you see here. L will go to T, T will go to O. O will go to L, L will go to T, T will go to O. Over and over and over and over. Yes? These are each proteins, that's correct. Uh -huh. They are separate but identical proteins. They differ only in their configuration depending upon where that thing is pointing at. Yep. Yes, sir? What draws the ATP of the ATP and the phosphorus to the L site? So, okay, good question. So how does ADP and phosphorus get into the L site? Like everything else in the cell, it's a simple process of diffusion. We think about how many things in our lives depend on the simple process of diffusion. It's a little scary because the process of diffusion is a random process. Yeah. Okay. LTO, LTO. Questions about that? Yes? Does the what? Well, that's a good question. So does the rate of ATP synthesis depend upon the strength of the gradient, how big the gradient is? The bigger the gradient, the faster this process will occur, yes. But, and this is a big but, as we will see. I'm probably not going to finish this today. I'll finish it tomorrow. The big but is, people laugh when I say big but because it sounds like, <laughs> I say that all the time, don't I? <laughs> My wife, she heard me sing this one time, and she just got the biggest laugh out of this. The big but is, all right, the big but is that, now everybody's thinking, and everybody's saying it, there's going to be giggles in the class, right? Is that there's limiting amounts of ADP. And that's what I'm going to finish with you with today. When would the cell have low levels of ADP? When it's doing nothing. Because, yeah, or the opposite, that's right. <laughs> nice try, all right? ADP is what we make when we burn ATP. So if we are not doing anything, if we're not exercising, we are sitting on the couch, what happens to our ATP levels? Our ATP levels go high. Okay. Think about this. This makes sense, folks. Do you breathe heavily when you're sitting there on the couch? Well, depends on what you're doing, I guess. But for the most part, you're, you're probably not breathing heavily. And that oxygen intake is a reflection of this. There's a relationship between your oxygen intake and these processes. We'll hear about that tomorrow.
Okay, yeah. Yes, sir. On Friday, yeah. there is a regional brewers conference up in Hood River. Okay. I know some of the firm side people in here will be going to that. Okay. And that Thanks for letting me know. And so that's why there's a show missing up in that corner. Thanks for letting me know. I appreciate that. So it's not that proteins that spin. Those proteins, the LT9 proteins, well, they don't spin. It's the thing inside. It's the thing inside of them. And the reason that, and the, that's one by, that's just the 